One great London institution that survived the war was the Royal Albert Hall, built by Queen Victoria. Memories? Memories, yes. You know, Ran, I remember when I first came to London, I was a little girl and I saw this little building. I knew that very, very few artists appeared here. It was just a pinnacle of an artist's dream to appear at the Albert Hall. The first famous artists that I heard was Yehudi Menuhin. And there I was in this vast building, listening in awe to Yehudi Menuhin, absolutely overwhelmed. I never even dreamt that I was going to play here one day. I was invited to give a recital. Uh -huh. And there I was, you know, me, little me, standing in this tremendous hall and playing with the piano. And it's been an unbroken link since then, because yes. I mean, all through the years now, That's all right. the proms, mm. etc., etc. I was linked and involved with the proms throughout my whole career. So I'm very proud to have been playing in, at the Albert Hall all my life. And then it comes, in 1987, I played the Britain Concerto at a prom concert with the BBC calm. Symphony, and conducted by my friend of so many years, Sir John Pritchard. And, and the chorale is just like... And the, the violin spins all this around. A bit of heaven, isn't it, it's, suddenly it's, coming. She's it's adored by the orchestral community in London, by which I mean all the orchestral players. When I sometimes announce, for example, on a BBC Symphony Orchestra tour that we're going to take it to handle, there's not one face that doesn't light up with appreciation. Now, the reason for this is that she's such a thoroughgoing professional. I have to confess that I never know how I'm going to play it. So every time I, I play it a little bit differently. Well, don't I sometimes I? think that yes, when, I'm, <laughs> when I'm accompanying it. I'm sure But I, I mean, it, that adds to the and, and the ending as what you just played. Can we just do it again? Yes. And, and start the, the chorale. Just, right. uh, just exactly where yes. you were. <laughs> We rehearse as we often do in a room together with a concerto, with myself at the piano. Uh, she's thinking of the whole thing in terms of the final uh, finished result. And that's something a conductor appreciates. is a privilege which is perceived by the orchestral musicians however far from the center from her actual performing uh, epicenter they are they realize that they're in the presence of a great musician i feel that i play for musicians basically i when i go out there on that stage i think only in terms of musicians because if the, uh, part of the audience likes me, I am happy, naturally. But I, I know I play for musicians, I play for orchestras, I play because these are the people who know what I'm doing. If I uh, satisfy musicians, if I satisfy the composer, then audiences are bound to appreciate that. Music is so versatile. It should reach everybody when it's really good. It's necessary to work in radio, TV, and recording studios to make our music available to as wide a public as possible. But it's not easy. If you play in a studio, for instance, where it's all so austere and clinical, and there is the light and you have to start playing, well, that's not very, very uh, gratifying. I always prefer to have a live audience in front of me. You can do so much more and give so much more, and you are much more at ease, in a sense, when you feel that there is a live audience listening and 
collaborating with you in that performance. The management of a career is terribly important and terribly difficult and a tremendous responsibility. In my case, of course, I, I had my father, who I thought, and a lot of other people thought, was absolutely marvelous. His involvement, some people resented very strongly. Perhaps we didn't have the savoir-faire or the PR which is necessary in order to establish a beautiful relationship with people because you do depend upon other people in order to have a career. I was sure with, with, with her that she is a great genius and that it doesn't mean a thing to me what, they, what people say. And I'm not referring only to Ida, but uh, young prodigies obviously have parents who look after them or guardians. And uh, sometimes an agent is not dealing with the prodigy ones, they're dealing with the parents, uh, which can, <coughs> in certain cases, make for difficulties. But after all, uh, you give a prodigy an opportunity, and if you advise them properly, they take advantage of that, they don't overexpose themselves. Um, and then it's up to them, really, whether their talent is going to develop in the way it should so that they become a great, uh, full-blown virtuoso. Father was very watchful over me, and especially in the developing years when I could have stopped developing and just become another violinist with uh, uh, technical skill and stopped there. But what made me quite desperate at times was his dissatisfaction with my, uh, with the purely musical development. And he was always saying, well, I'm not satisfied. You play beautifully, but that's not good enough. I want you to become a serious musician, not just a good fiddle player. And as I grew older, I then realized myself that this is the most important thing. 